Good day. Well, this is uh, welcome to the Daily Mavericks webinar on Rhino Day. I hope that in a year's time we'll have another webinar on Rhino Day, which will say uh, talk about our global successes in uh, looking. Oh. But at the moment, uh, we're going to be talking about rhino poaching. I'm Don Pinock. I'm an environmental journalist. I work with uh, Our Burning Planet. I was an editor of Getaway. Um, appropriately, I guess, for this conversation, um, I'm a criminologist specializing in gang. In the room today, we're very fortunate to have uh, a number of people. One is Dr. Latunda Zeba. He's the CEO of Sandbox, and uh, he's also um, a chair uh, on the expert panel on intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity econom ecosystem services. That's the last mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> he also worked with San he's also worked with Sands Parks with African Center for Ecology at Nelson Mandela uh, University um, at WITS on the Global Change Institute. He has a BSc and an MSc in agriculture um, from Fort Hare and a PhD from Utah State University in rangeland science. So well qualified to join us um, in this debate. Dr. Joe Shaw is senior manager um, of the Wildlife Africa Rhino lead at, at WWF. Um, she's specialized in Vietnamese rhino horn trade. And she's worked on black rhino nutrition uh, on, with her, for the Frankfurt Zoological Society, the Tsualu um, Reserve. Uh, she has a BSc in, from Melbourne University and from King's College London, two BSc, um, an MSc from UCT and a PhD from WITS, um, which I think was on Black Rhino, Joe, yes. Okay, and That's also, right. in, yes, also, uh, sorry about that. Um, also in the room, uh, on Nicole Williamson, she's doing the techie stuff. Um, and uh, APSA, um, who have teamed up with, with Our Burning Planet to uh, highlight environmental issues and to have discussions like this. Um, also in the room are many people from all over the world. You uh, are very welcome, and I, I hope you will in, uh, inter, in discuss with us. Uh, you can do that through the chat room. You can put your questions there. And towards the end of this process, uh, we will approach those questions. Okay. Now, wh what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to start the discussion by being a bit provocative. Um, I'm going to frame this uh, in a particular way, and I'm going to start off by doing it with this slide. Now, um, I'm not going to get technical, but I want to show you something odd. Um, if you look at that slide, that's rhino poaching from 1984 um, uh, uh, all the way to 2008. There's another slide that will come up shortly. But um, in the early part of that slide, up to 1993, there was very high rhino poaching, and it was mainly in Zimbabwe. Suddenly, it went right down. There was almost no poaching very little poaching between 94 and 2007, um, and then a very high poaching from 2008, and that was mainly in South Africa. Now, um, the question really is why? What, what, what's going on there? And I offer this for discussion, and then uh, I will put it to you, and you can um, you know, accept, reject, uh, or, or debate this thing. Um, if you look at the number of black and white rhinos in Africa, they plummeted from about 65,000 in 1987 to um, 2,700 in 1993. Um, uh, just go back to that previous slide, Nick, for a moment. I'll give you a shout when the next slide should come on. Um, now, why did they drop? I think that um, largely that is due to the Pelley Amendment, which kicked in in the United States. Now, that's a law which authorized the US president to limit the importation of any product from a country where nationals are engaging in trade which diminishes conservation and, and threatens endangered species. Um, what it did is it resulted in a universal ban on the trade in rhino horn. Even China stopped trading. And with the trade loopholes shut, there was very little demand. Rhino poaching went down and the numbers of rhinos began to rise. Now, 
in 2003, where you start to see the bumps in the, in the slides starting to jump, um, um, that was when mainly Vietnamese cartels found a loophole through legitimate hunting in South Africa. South Africa was selling over a thousand rhino, legal rhino hunts to Vietnamese criminals. They probably didn't know they were criminals, but, but they were. Uh, Kesavang in, in Vietnam was one of them. And, and also to Eastern European intermediaries. And they were even using Asian prostitutes as fake hunters. They actually pulled the triggers. They probably missed, but somebody else did the job. Now, these, what it meant is that these crime syndicates had in their possession over a thousand legal rhino CITES permits, which they could then launder um, uh, poached rhino horn through the Asian markets. And uh, at about that point, um, uh, rhino poaching went through the roof. Now, so I want to start this debate uh, with that. Could I have the next slide, please, uh, Nicole? Um, I'll just wait for that. Now, what I want to start this debate with are two assertions, and, and you know, we can agree or dismiss these. Um, the, the one is that South Africa created loopholes that were exploited by uh, tiny syndicates. Through licensing of hunting and now legalizing internal trade, we caused the poaching tsunami and not the Vietnamese politician claiming that the horn caused cancer. Um, this slide uh, uh, is an extension of the other slide. Um, it goes all the way to um, 2014. You see rhino poaching dropping. That's um, a discussion we can have. It was either and probably both um, good activity from sandpox and uh, anti-rhino perching, but also because we were running out of rhinos. And that's a debate we can have too. The second assertion is that the only way we're going to shut down um, this poaching is to shut down trade in rhino horn, remove all the loopholes and the mixed messaging, and kick in initiatives like the Pelly Amendment. And that's the only way I understand uh, how we could do anything. We can hold the fort from this end, but in the international context, that's what needs to happen. Now, I have other questions. Um, I, I want to see if the other slide will come on. I'll, I'll mention uh, something about that. That's just a, a slide of all of Africa. Um, but that's my, that's my introduction. Um, and uh, perhaps you'd like to, either one of you would like to talk about that. Any aspect of that? Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. A, a provocative introduction, indeed. Um, perhaps, perhaps I can respond. Perhaps I could respond just by describing some other historical trends and and the broader context. I think this fits in. If that's okay. Thank so, you, Joe. I'm going to ask uh, Nicole to take off the slides so we can see you okay. more properly. Okay, you can, see my, you can see my face and hands. So, two species of rhino in Africa, black and white rhino, and they followed very different trajectories. So, black rhino, black rhino prior to your slides, there was a huge poaching um, impact on black rhino populations across Africa. So, it's estimated prior to the 60s, there were maybe 100,000 of them. And that crashed to about two and a half thousand by the mid 90s. So they showed this dramatic decline, um, primarily due to poaching, knocking out entire nations of populations from um, Zambia, very hard hitting in Kenya and Tanzania. And most of that horn was going out through the uh, Horn of Africa into the Yemen, where it was being used um, in Jambia handles for horns, the horns of, of these dagger Jambia handles. Um, white rhino actually follow an entirely opposite trajectory. So they were reduced down to perhaps 50 individuals in Shishli and Pelosi at the turn of the 19th century, again, primarily due to, to actually legal hunting. And from there, we've brought them back to, um, I think the latest estimates are somewhere around 17 or 18,000. Um, and they, they've recovered underneath this time period we're looking at. So, um, if we look at rhino, pop, if we look at, if you're focusing on this period from the mid '90s to today, 
Um, black rhino numbers have in fact doubled over that period. We have seen some decline in, in white rhino populations again. If we're looking at horn, I think it's that history goes even further back. So, so it's been part of traditional Asian medicine for for centuries. It's used um, in in carvings, in ornaments, um, particularly in libation cups because it was believed to be able to detect poison. Um, but it also uh, is believed to have these these cooling and cleansing properties. So the Pelly amendments that you refer to. Um, uh, were actually put against Taiwan and Japan in the mid 90s, and that did close down uh, the, the markets at that point in time. The the poaching uh, that happened, if we look at your your first graph, so what we actually saw was the poaching was happening in in Zim. It was brought under control for a while and went quiet, but the network started operating again in Zimbabwe in the mid 2000s before they picked up again in South Africa. So the, the um, improved enforcement in Zimbabwe pushed those networks into South Africa, and that's where things picked up. There was a as we look at the the rising disposable income in Vietnam um, over that period, there was a brand new form of use happening there. That they started to develop these these grinding bowls, which actually have pictures of of Asian of black miners on the outside. But this new method of taking horn um, from a grinding bolt, grinding it up, taking the horn, very much a form of conspicuous consumption. But it was being used for hangovers, um, but there was a real status associated with the use of horn. Um, so there are pending Pelly amendments against both Vietnam and Mozambique um, with the US government. But I think it's I think the it's important to look at all of these different trends and and patterns over not just decades but potentially uh, even longer time periods to get a full picture of what's going on here. Okay, Joe, thank you, Latonda. Do you want to pop in on that, or should we go right into questions closer to home? Well, I mean, I think I mean you you have made a couple of very important points, Don. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. That's okay. Fine. Cool. Um, I hope you hear me. I think I've got a time lag. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I think what is key, like, and and I think uh, perhaps uh, is it's something that uh, Joe touched on uh, in in part is 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 the fact that uh, we we have been at different points. You know, even just if you look at the last century, with regards to the conservation status of, uh, for instance, both black. And white rhino. Uh, if you look, for instance, uh, to the fact that we only had a couple of, you know, hundred, uh, you know, white rhino in the 60s that were, you know, uh, introduced from Kukluem Folozi to places like Kruger National Park and other, like, uh, you know, nature reserves in the country, uh, to the point where by around uh, 2000, uh, 2008, we were basically sitting at uh, over like, uh, you know, uh, 10,000, you know, possibly 12,000, you know, white rhino in the country. I think another way of looking at, 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 the, at the alarming stats and the picture that we're looking at today is, is the fact that it is possible to actually, uh, you know, uh, do something, you know, to, 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 uh, basically restore like uh, you know uh, the species but i think it is important to know what is it we need to do in order to basically um, you know protect rhino in the wild what do we need to do in order to ensure we create conditions uh, for rhino uh, you know to to breed and grow uh, you know without you know being harassed really like i mean to be honest by poachers and 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 ensure that uh, you know we have uh, thriving populations. You, you've made assertions which uh, perhaps I think Joe is best uh, placed uh, to, to, to deal with with regards to uh, aspects that deal with enforcement about maybe we might have created uh, loopholes, uh, for instance, as, as South Africa, you know, uh, in, 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 in basically legalizing hunting and, and, and giving, uh, you know, permits uh, to, to international hunters. Uh, it, it is possible, but I think um, right now with um, 
within the context of national parks, for instance, uh, there has never been hunting in national parks. But uh, we are experiencing the brunt of, uh, you know, the scourge of poaching. And uh, if, if you look, for instance, at Kruger in particular, where our largest rhino, uh, white rhino population is at, you know, like, I mean, we experience, you know, some of the most severe uh, poaching. Shukru uh, and as well, which is also a state-owned, uh, you know, uh, nature reserve, you know, experiences significant, um, you know, uh, uh, poaching. And, and I think the question is, you know, uh, we, we have, you know, like, I mean, we still have uh, legal hunting, even though people might not necessarily be able to, uh, you know, export, you know, uh, rhino horn because of they don't, ha they, they, they don't have permits, for instance, uh, for black rhino. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is to note the fact that the poachers basically have targeted places that are not necessarily the places where hunting is taking place. Or I think, can, I stop you there? can I just stop you there to take you further? Mm. Um, um, how, you know, how do you count, take Kruger, for instance, that's that's a core area. How do you count rhino and how many are there? I mean, am I allowed to ask that? Because there's so many, you know, the the your last report said 3,500, I've heard under 2,000. I mean, what is the state of rhino? Uh, in terms of numbers, particularly in Kruger. It's a good starting point. Well, well, Don, I think, I mean, we, we have reported quite openly about the fact that uh, our rhino population has uh, declined by close to 70% over the last uh, 10 years. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, has been really because of uh, relentless uh, poaching. Uh, we, we, we have officially released numbers up to uh, 2020 uh, or during the 2019-2020 reporting period, where basically we had about, uh, you know, uh, 3,500 uh, rhino. We know that it is very difficult to, 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 to count rhino in the wild, especially in, a, in an area that is as large as, uh, as Kruger National Park. And, uh, and we, we, we find that there are a number of factors that actually affect our ability to, to count rhino. For instance, uh, what we call uh, detectability uh, bias. Uh, you know, basically a, a rhino that is further, for instance, uh, away from the observer by 200 meters is harder to see than a rhino that is much closer. We also have a, a, what we call availability bias, which is basically that rhinos that are you know, standing under trees, you know, when you're flying over with a, with a helicopter during a census are much harder uh, to, to see. And uh, I think our estimates are that like uh, possibly during any given day when we're hunting, I mean, counting, uh, you know, rhinos are hiding under, like, I mean, about 30% of the rhinos might actually be under trees, uh, you know, even, you know, just running away you know, from the sound of the helicopter. So what's your uh, estimate? So what's pardon? your estimate? What, so, so what's the estimate? Given that our our, our yeah. estimate, Don, is that uh, we, I mean, we're still continuing to 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 uh, you know experience decline. We suspect that uh, possibly for the first time we will be reporting under three thousand uh, rhino, like I mean, in Kruger National mm -hmm. Park, and that is something that is a huge uh, you know uh, concern for us. Yeah, and of course, success in curbing poaching in terms of falling poached numbers might also be because there are fewer rhinos. Um, uh, but but can I can I just go to Joe here? Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Lutanda. Can I? I'll come back to you in a moment. I, I just want to go to Joe. You got an article with Julian Reidemey in Daily Maverick today, uh, where you pointed out that a guy like Darby Krunewald, who's got hundreds of convictions that have been hanging over him for 11 years, is still out. What's wrong with the justice system, Joe? I mean, how can you not put a guy like that behind bars? Any idea? Yeah, it's a very good question, Don. Um, and I, I think perhaps, and I feel like it's a drum that's been beaten for a long time, but I think part of the problem is that people still see rhino poaching as the death of a rhino, and are not seeing it as a form of organized syndicated crime. Uh, the fact that the, the commodity being traded 
comes from wildlife doesn't really matter. The fact is that this needs to be addressed across borders, across agencies as, as syndicated organized crime. And I think if we were working it on it at that level and bringing all the tools to bear, so if we start hitting these guys where it hurts, bring it using, uh, tracking the financial flows, using asset forfeiture, perhaps if we recognize the crime as, as um, working at that level of severity, we might have more impact. And, and that's nothing against the good work that's been done by the investigators um, to date, but we we need more cooperation, I think, and recognition of this as organized crime. What do those networks look like, Joe? I mean, give us a sort of sketch of the, the organized crime networks that uh, incorporate rhino poaching, but are much bigger. You've been working in Vietnam. Places like that. So, so, I mean, I think it, it sounds like this mysterious nebulous thing, but um, in fact, it, it the, the organized networks have, as all organized um, crime does, John, you, uh, Don, you know this as well as I do, that, that corruption is the, the oil that smooths the organized crime networks. So these, at every level from inside the park to moving the horn to the, to the airport, to exporting the horn at, um, at the airport level, there are people on the inside, um, and what is concerning is the level of sophistication at which people are being entrapped or threatened or um, pulled into some of these networks. Um, but it, the, the networks reach all the way from the park to the export point to the consumer country. Um, and I think when we look at places around our national parks like Kruger, Take the case of, of Petrus Mabuza, Mr. Big or Mshengu. I mean, he was recently taken out in, a, in an execution hit here in Hazy View, um, but is alleged to have connections with all kinds of other serious organized crimes. And, and that's the level of threat that, that conservation agencies are having to deal with. Well, you know, the, the, the feeling one gets, but it's just from the outside, is that the networks are far more sophisticated than our justice system. They're outgunning us, they're, they're outsmarting us. I mean, that, that's, that's just a sort of public view of that. But um, um, we can comment on that in a moment, but Lutundo, I want to come back to you. Um, and, and really, the, the steps that, that are being taken by uh, particularly Kruger to deal with that poaching. I mean, could you just give us a sketch of some of the things? I know that you've got a a mere cat system in there <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of ways of tracking. But what are you doing about poaching in Kruger now and what's it look like? I mean, how many people are there poachers in Kruger at any one time? Um, there seems to be a lot. Well, thanks, John. I think, I mean, on a typical day, like we have, you know, like, I mean, between three and uh, six incursions that are detected by, you know, our our rangers. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think, I mean, basically, uh, you know, every day rangers are basically uh, encountering uh, poachers in, 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 in the bush. We, we have a number of uh, programs uh, that include, uh, for instance, ranger services who are actually monitoring, you know, like uh, both uh, the perimeter and areas where we have uh, high concentrations of rhinos in the uh, intensive protection zone, as we call it. Uh, we have technology, uh, for instance, uh, that helps us with detection of people that are coming into the park, uh, for instance. Uh, and also uh, we've got gun shot uh, sensors and other like, uh, uh, you know, uh, technologies. But we've also tried to strengthen, you know, our security in the in the entrance gates because we know that uh, some of the poachers come in as, uh, you know, normal visitors, but actually get dropped inside the park and uh, and uh, and then be involved in illegal activities. I think that, um, you know, I mean, if you look just at the quantum of funding we are spending in a place like Kruger National Park, which is well in excess of 200 million rands 
on basically ranger services and anti-poaching you know one you know sees that there's a lot of investment that we are making in uh, in, in anti-poaching but uh, it's still not enough uh, if you look at the numbers of animals that are poached uh, you know every year like i mean right now we're around 200 uh, plus animals uh, as of i mean as of last year and uh, every year we are systematically reducing the number of animals that are being poached but uh, it is it is really like i mean a, an attrition battle if you I mean that's that's startling. Yeah, two hundred million on anti-poaching, and maybe you've lost two hundred rhinos. That's a million rand a rhino. That's very expensive expenditure. Uh, it's that, that's that's scary. Um, um, uh, Joe, can can I come back to you? Um, I part of the solutions um, are sanctuaries, and it's really both of you. Uh, I'd like you to chat about that. Um, the, the relationship between sanctuaries in private hands um, and uh, the possibility of them being uh, having fence sanctuaries with the, even within Kruger um, is are these things options? What what is the state of? I mean, we're in crisis mode here. Uh, sanctuaries, defended sanctuaries, and adding to that, Joe, I'd just like to know what you think uh, about military style. Um, protections. Jo, over to you. Uh, thanks, Don. So um, I think one, part of the solution to the to the earlier, earlier poaching threat that I described at the beginning was, I think when you, when you talk about sanctuaries, you're thinking about intensive protection zones, really focusing down on a small geographic area within a bigger one um, in terms of securing rhino. I think when you're looking at something of, of the scale of, of Kruger that does become necessary. What, I think we recognize that one of the challenges for Kruger is its vast size, as well as the huge number of people living alongside it and an international boundary. It's, it's a very challenging place for, for those rhinos to live. If, if, I think if we think of sanctuaries um, and it doesn't, there are many smaller reserves or reserves that happen to be located in different places where rhinos, are st or be they national parks or private areas, where rhinos are still doing really well. They've been um, flying under the poaching radar so far, um, perhaps because of distance from pressure, and perhaps because of the, the good security and the good relations with communities um, within those parks. And, and that's in South Africa, but also across the continent. I, I am, um, we are wary of a very yeah. militaristic, I think that um, good relations with people living around protected areas, having people benefiting from protected areas is, is vital for their, for their future, for all of our future. Um, and and a, a very militaristic approach uh, can have the opposite to the desired effect. Um, Latonda. Sanctuaries. Yeah, I I think I want to first like I mean uh, affirm the point that uh, Joe is making about uh, you know the the role of inclusion of communities in in rhino conservation and and I think ensuring that there is broader uh, sense of ownership of of rhino. But uh, I mean, given what we have done over the years in in, in sun parks. We, we are quite open and actually are pursuing, you know, uh, a range of options around, uh, you know, uh, sanctuaries. Um, I mean, fenced and unfenced uh, areas. For instance, our intensive protection zone in the south is not necessarily a fenced sanctuary, but we are considering, you know, that at this point, given the rate at which we are uh, losing rhino, we do want to put insurance, you know, population within Kruger because some of the challenges that we are experiencing, for instance, uh, in Kruger National Park is that uh, we have a TB problem, which has basically makes it difficult to uh, move animals uh, with ease uh, across the country. So um, if we were to start, like, I mean, we need to start looking at how can we do that within Kruger? But we are also working with the Wilderness Foundation, for instance, and other partners to look at other sites around the countries where we can see you know, land or find land of, you know, uh, decent size 
And when we talk about that, we're thinking, you know, 40 to 50,000 hectares and, and, and more, where we can start to introduce uh, founder uh, populations that are functional, meaning that they can breed and grow uh, and, and, and help us, you know, mitigate some of the losses that, for instance, we are experiencing in Kruger. So we are definitely open to sanctuaries. And in fact, a few years ago, uh, before the outbreak of uh, TB in Rhino in Kruger, or before the discovery of TB in Rhino in Kruger, uh, we were actually selling, uh, you know, Rhino to private owners uh, in areas that are far from, you know, poaching pressure, which we called Rhino strongholds. So as an organization, we've embraced the concept that we do need to create uh, populations away from areas where we are experiencing intense uh, poaching. Now, most of the rhinos in South Africa are in private hands, um, and uh, that's extraordinary. Um, it's good in some respects, but uh, if you look at the high-level panels um, policy processes, um, they make a distinction between intensive and extensive areas, the intensive breeding areas and extensive conservation areas. And um, you know, if, if rhinos are going to be placed from state parks into private hands in a sanctuary situation, um, I mean, is there an awareness of the difference between those two? Because the, the, you know, that policy document is basically saying one's good, one's not good. It would be wrong to put them in the wrong hands, I basically is what I'm saying. Either of you. Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, the, the, the policy favors more extensive wild populations, but it does have a qualifier that says that for conservation purposes, uh, you know, there might be situations where it might be important to basically, uh, you know, manage uh, populations, perhaps in smaller, uh, relatively perhaps intense, uh, you know, uh, operations intensive operations but i think what is key like i mean uh, for for us as a, as an organization is that our, our observation is that in our smaller rhino parks and, and again this is relative to kruger national park which is two million hectares and some of our smaller rhino parks basically are ranging between 40 and and maybe 100 and and, and, and 80 000 hectares uh, and and so that is the sort of size we are looking at uh, and uh, but I think in the in the case of, of of private owners, what we would prefer is that as long as you know key ecological uh, you know uh, uh, processes are not compromised, you know uh, animals are able to to roam and animals uh, are able to to choose you know uh, you know mating and choose landscape and forage uh, you know uh, relatively free. We, we, we support uh, that, but at the same time, we recognize that, um, you know, the, over, over the years, especially because during the period when there was no poaching and there was a good local market for, for, to trade in rhino, not in rhino horn, but in rhino where people were, were, were yeah. selling rhino uh, to other owners. Uh, I mean, the rhino, I mean, th there was a growth in the private sector, like, I mean, uh, uh, participation in, in rhino conservation. And, uh, and I think that that is something, as you, as you indicate, Don, must be commended. But at the same time, I think what we need to emphasize is that it must be done, uh, you know, right, so that at the end of the day, you don't have, you know, compromised genetics, you don't have a situation where you over intensify to the point where you have to hand raise or hand feed rhinos. Uh, I don't think uh, that is something that uh, we, we we see as necessarily beneficial overall. But I think uh, where there are reasons to intensify in order to achieve conservation objectives, we are definitely in support of that. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Lutonde, you represent a, a major state um, uh, conservation organization and Joe you are part of a very big uh, NGO this is a, a, a discussion and not a question and answer I would think maybe that there might be questions that you might like to ask each other at this point in terms of or is there an accord in how you uh, work or operate together Yeah, inter interesting question. Um, we're certainly working very closely with uh, Sandpox in Kruger in, in terms of 
um, our Kessel program there, uh, looking at addressing the impacts of wildlife trafficking on, on people around the park and, and um, supporting the park itself. Um, we also have the Black Rhino Range expansion projects uh, where we're not partnering with Sandpox as yet, but I think there'd be an opportunity to do so in future. And, and that speaks to the kind of model you've described there, Don, where we, we create new populations of rhino, 30 new populations to date in, in smaller private land areas. And those black rhino numbers have, have grown and are part of the reason why the population numbers have doubled over the last 25 years. So um, I would say that, that we work well and closely with, with Sandbox and look for further collaboration in future. Yeah. I mean, again, can affirm the same, uh, but also like uh, not only with uh, WWF uh, South Africa, but also sometimes in, uh, you know, three-way partnerships, for instance, WWF, uh, World Wilderness Foundation, Sun Parks, uh, you know, partnerships uh, around uh, rhino uh, conservation. But I think uh, what is key, uh, you know, uh, Don, and maybe this is a question that I can uh, pose to 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 Joe. Uh, I mean, and especially given the sort of global uh, footprint of of an organization like WWF, what do you do? You see, for instance, an opportunity uh, for uh, I mean, given the cost of rhino protection, for 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 us to be able to share a message, you know, globally around you know the. I think what should be a global responsibility to protect rhino. Uh, can we be able to mobilize funding globally to protect rhino populations in Africa? Because um, if we close, for instance, this is the argument, especially by the private sector, that if you close trade, then we don't have options for funding uh, rhino conservation, especially against poaching. Do you see that as an area where perhaps uh, there is an opportunity to engage, uh, you know, the global community and, uh, and, 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 and source or mobilize resources to support, uh, you know, conservation of rhino. Uh, absolutely, Lutando. I mean, I think there's been huge investments uh, into rhino conservation over the last decade in terms of the threats we've identified. In a way, almost the greatest threat for rhinos now is the fact that they cost so much to, to protect and secure far more than they can generate in terms of the, the criminal threats that we're describing today. And, and I think it's important in terms of the high level panel report recommendations to view it through this additional layer of, of criminality and threat. Um, and the fact that runners unfortunately cost more than they, they generate today. And, and globally, we, we need to find a solution to that. Mm. Okay, can I just jump in here? I'm I'm going to ask, I'm going to come back to where I began and then we're going to go to questions because there's a lot of questions coming in and they're very good questions. But <clears throat> the one is that really we, uh, we cannot solve the problem from this end only. Um, and that goes into what you've just asked, Joe uh, Dutando. Um, you know, we, we've got to work in an international matrix and, and something like the Pillar Amendment and others. Um, but the other is an acknowledgement that it's not an Asian problem that we are dealing with. It's a South African generated problem that we kicked off. Um, and, and now we need international assistance uh, uh, to, to, to get on top of. Um, I just, it's flagging that, but I do, I do want to go to questions, um, um, unless you really want to object or reply to me on, on, on my, that, that, that summary. Um, was one, two, three. Okay, I'm going uh, to go into <laughs> Yes, I, I don't think it's. I, I, I like your. Um, I like your contentious move on, but I. I think this is a huge challenge over time and space. Um, I, I think understanding one of one of the pieces of work we're doing at the moment that I'm really excited about is looking at rhino horn prices globally because I think we need to understand where the horn is going now, what it's being used for, what people are paying for it. And, and that is the kind of information that will help us design the right mm -hmm. solutions. All right, look, I, uh, people, are, uh, please drop your questions into the, the chat. Uh, I'm going to start, and um, <clears throat> this one comes from Benita Reed. She says, um, she's sorry to ask the question, but could some rangers be involved in taking money 
to look the other way. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, most rangers are good people, but, you know, what about, I suppose it's really corruption within the park. It's under, it's yours, really. Yeah, no, like, I mean, I think we, we, we do acknowledge that, I mean, uh, you do have, uh, you know, bad apples sometimes. Uh, but I think one of the things that we have uh, been trying to do is strengthen our, our, our processes to be able to uh, identify and deter, like, I mean, uh, you know, people who, who are involved, you know, in, as, you know, who are basically corrupt, if I may put it that way. And, uh, and I think uh, Joe can, can speak better to some of the pressures, you know, rangers and their families face uh, but we, we think that uh, people should basically uh, report when they feel that their lives or their families are under pressure and, and seek support uh, from the organization rather than resort to uh, helping criminal syndicates. One can of the you, challenges... Sorry, can you, uh, are you allowed to do lie detector tests on ranges? We we are actually working on a, on a policy like that. In fact, one of the interventions that we are looking at is to set up a completely new specialist ranger services, where we're going to have you know a different set of uh, you know employment conditions that include you know regular light detector, like I mean, and uh, and integrity testing mechanisms because uh, there, there are things that we, you deal with as complexities. Uh, with current staff that are part of, um, you know, uh, labor relations uh, issues. But uh, with, sure. with this, with this um, you know, special ranger call, we, we will set up new, uh, you know, contractual arrangements that then allow us to be able to do those on a regular basis. But I think what is more important, and maybe Joe can come in on this, is actually the kind of support that we provide socially to be able to uh, prevent some of the pressures uh, that uh, some of the staff are facing. It's not ranger on rangers only. You can find stuff in the gate. You can find staff who might have access to information about where I know are. So it's not just rangers. It's actually wider than rangers that you get. You know, staff being corrupted. Joe, I don't want you to jump in there, Joe. If you don't mind, I, I want to pose another question. It's a quick one from Jeff Schaefer. Um, he says, "Is it against the South African Constitution to shoot a poacher?" I suppose the next question is, do you? But um... <laughs> uh, there are very strict rules of engagement which the law enforcement agencies have to um, work under. Uh, okay, as simple as that. Um, uh, the Rosemary Walsworth uh, Cromarty asks. Um, what is the level of bribery between African governments and Asian countries? Joe, I guess that's you, but I mean, uh, I, I'm, that's so broad, I'm not sure how exactly one answers that. Um, there must be bribery somewhere between syndicates and other people. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I can't comment on, on government bribery, but as we've touched on, uh, corruption enables every step of the chain in terms of the, the syndicates involved. Um. Okay. Um, Rosie Bosman says, what can concerned citizens do? We don't have financial power. What, what, what can we do sitting out here? I mean, very interesting question. I think, uh, I mean, one is, is obviously to, 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 to raise awareness, uh, particularly, uh, I mean, for instance, citizens have got a lot of power through social media to influence. Uh, and I think we can influence positively, uh, for instance, uh, about the plight of Rhino, uh, the contribution that Rhino, um, you know, uh, make uh, to, for instance, um, you know, biodiversity, the, the issues that if we lose our biodiversity, basically, we know that there are linkages to, uh, you know, our world, I mean, loss of well-being. So I think that even just carrying out those messages, uh, carrying out messages about, you know, uh, particularly to reaching to Asian countries where possible about, you know, how the impact of some of the actions by, you know, like, I mean, uh, people who are involved in poaching and in, 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 in poaching syndicates actually affect 
you know, livelihoods, uh, you know, uh, of people uh, living next to some of these uh, protected areas where rhinos are kept. Thanks, Akbar. Uh, John, Jan Glazeski, <clears throat> he says that he understands that the Pele Amendment uh, curtails wildlife products into the US um, when the, the, those kind of issues happen. But uh, can South Africa not use diplomatic means to persuade Asian countries to enact equivalent Pele Amendment laws? Joe, is that probably worse? Uh, yeah, the, the Pele Amendments come from the US, but then they are they enact upon the, the country that it's been raised by. Um, certainly over the last decade, I know part of the South African government's response has been um, setting up MOUs and agreements with key countries uh, like Vietnam, uh, Mozambique and others in terms of trying to address the problem together. So there are various diplomatic mechanisms that are being used. Okay. Um, has COVID reduced or, or increased poaching? Is that, that's a question that comes from Ian Cotton. Yeah. Um, I mean, just for a short while, really, it was mostly during the higher, like, I mean, lockdown levels, like lockdown level four and five uh, last year that we sort of saw a bit of a breather, but as soon as we went down to other, like I mean, lower levels, um, you know, uh, basically poaching uh, syndicate or poachers returned and started, uh, you know, poaching. So it would seem like I mean, it was only safe uh, for, for 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 rhinos when people could hardly move, and and I think that is a very sad state. Okay. Can, can I just add to that, Don? That, thanks, Latando. I think that's important in terms of the direct poaching pressure and how lockdown stopped the movement of people and products. Sadly, since then, poaching and, and seizures have both gone up. But I think the impact of tourism restrictions, that the fact that we're not getting people into our, into our national parks or our provincial parks or our private areas has been absolutely devastating on operating budgets. The basic mm -hmm. operating budget and rhino protection sure. measures by parks. And, and um, that brief respite that was caused by the COVID travel restrictions has been blown out of the water now by the fact that the income generated by these areas from tourism has just been lost. And, and in many countries, South Africa is still on a red list. We're still not seeing the tourism that we need. And, and to me, that's one of the, the biggest threats that we're facing. Yeah. Um, couldn't agree more, uh, Joe. No, no, I'm saying I couldn't agree more with Joe, and and I think I mean if you look at um, international visitors, uh, both to private and public, you know, like I mean, uh, you know, private, pro I mean, protected areas, uh, basically has declined significantly, and uh, and the loss of revenue, you know, which then goes into you know, a number of activities, including anti-poaching activities, you know, is is a huge impact on 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 on, on conservation, on rhino conservation in particular. Okay, um, here's a question from Alistair Stalker. He says, "Could either of you comment um, on the influence of John Hume with his two thousand rhinos and Pelham Jones muddying the international view of horn sales?" <laughs> Interesting question. I, I, I think, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not, not directly involved, like, I mean, with the, with the, with the areas of, you know, uh, efforts by private sector to trade. But I think one of the, you know, challenges that we, we, we see is that um, there must be international buy-in in order for South Africa to really be able to, to trade. Uh, South Africa can make a unilateral decision, for instance, to trade and, uh, and be able to, to get the support. And I think, I mean, the failure of the local auction, like I mean, uh, in Rhino Horn, uh, or like, I mean, to really be set up competitive prices suggests that, you know, like, I mean, uh, that is not something that is, that is viable. Mm. Um, are there plans in place, um, and uh, this comes from Luther uh, Muteri, are there plans in place for regeneration of rhinos? So, you know, what 
what plans are there to there, there must be a, a, a increasing dilution of the genetic stock uh, as rhinos go down are there plans for regeneration and i suppose that links into an issue around the the poaching and the impact on rhino cows lutanda yeah i mean we one of the i think the biggest challenges that we deal with obviously that come in done is the is the impact i mean it's poaching on rhino cows where for instance you find that uh, a rhino cow that is with a sub like i mean adult uh, calf uh, is basically uh, if somebody shoots a cow the, the calf that is walking with is usually vulnerable uh, to either predation uh, or to uh, and, and as a result you know you lose two animals instantly and uh, if it is pregnant you're losing three animals you know and then future generations of animals and that is something that we are concerned about but there are plans in place that we we are looking at uh, with partners to uh, basically get more land and also we are mobilizing resources to be able to buy more land and introduce uh, populations in safer zones and uh, and that is something that you know we hope uh, is going to help us to uh, regenerate especially i mean i'm speaking now for the public sector the the rhino population that is managed by the state for instance one of the things that maybe people are not aware is the fact that even though we are losing you know rhino uh, uh, you know in kruger uh, at rates that we are very much concerned about uh, our rhinos in the other like i mean rhino parks are actually growing at about six seven percent uh, per annum so this is something that gives us hope that you know by creating other like i mean uh, alternative populations you know even under state management you know we we actually have hope that we will turn you know like i mean uh, uh, the, the the current trend and start to see like i mean uh, growth in the rhino population it might not necessarily be growth in the immediate future in Kruger National Park, but definitely uh, in the other, like I mean, parks and other sanctuaries that we are looking at. Okay, that's very encouraging. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, just add, I have mentioned our Black Rhino range expansion work, but this is a really, it, it, there are, um, this creation of new populations in safe areas in good habitat elsewhere is a really important part of the toolbox. Um, and it's being done across the continent um, in, in Rwanda, in Malawi, uh, if rhinos are put somewhere with good food where they're safe, put in enough of them, put in a family population of about 20 to 50, and they can do really well, they, they can recover. And I think that's an important thing for us to, to bear in mind. Mm, that's great. Uh, Tony Billing says, if you cut off the horns, does it reduce poaching? At a, at a site level, uh, certainly in the, the small um, reserves we're seeing around South Africa, yes, absolutely. It does seem to have a clear deterrent effect. Sorry, Latanda, I'm not sure whether you... No, 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 like, I mean, that's it, fine, Joe. Like, I think, I mean, we we are, like, I mean, looking at uh, strategic interventions to dehorn in Kruger, and uh, we're actually dehorning uh, females, and, uh, and, and, and we're actually expanding that program because we, we hope... I mean, from the lessons that we have learned from the private sector, that it does, you know, have a deterrent effect. But we haven't seen it at a large scale in a large national park, uh, you know, uh, where we can say for sure it does work. But we hope it does. Uh, Dave Balfour has asked a really interesting question: Do we really know enough about the business model of organised crime, its leadership, um, in the shifting rhino poaching pressures? I mean, we we talk about uh, demand for for horn. But what does it really mean? You know, what's happening inside these crime syndicates and how does that shift around? Uh, they're not only dealing with rhino horn. They're probably stockpiling it against extinction. So I think that the stockpiling is something we really need to understand more about and, and get our heads around that. This is all a good question, Dave. Um, and what we can, I think, there are tools we can bring from other sectors. There's the ability to follow the money and track financial flows through these networks is a really powerful way to understand how they're structured and how they reorganize themselves. So I think that's something positive that's happening more and more at the moment. But whether horn is immediately being consumed or whether it's being stockpiled at various 
points along the chain has um, and what the impact of that is on how the, the consumers and buyers perceive it has really important implications for how we manage our stockpiles uh, globally. Um, so I think there's a lot more that we need to, to understand at that level. A, a, a question that, that, that leads into that really <clears throat> from Alan Patterson is um, how's that message doing in Vietnam and China? Uh, you know, um, is it yesterday's news? We used to have Jackie Chan being very active, but but uh, the you know is is that pressure being kept up, or is Rhino's old news? So the, I think there has been good collaboration um, from China and Vietnam with the South African agencies from from a law enforcement effort. In terms of behaviour change. Um, just because we're not seeing awareness raising and behavior change are very different things um, and the, we really need to understand uh, as i've described we need to understand who is using the horn now what they're paying for it why they're using it once we understand the drivers of consumption then you're better able to to target the reasons behind the purchase of the product okay um uh, Stephen Paul actually, I suppose, asks a similar question. I mean, are China and Vietnam actually taking it seriously, the problem with rhinos? So, you know, do, does one get a sense that the administrations are serious about this or will they just bat it away? I think there's been a good collaboration from both governments on a law enforcement um, route recently. I understand particularly... Uh, particularly the Chinese government are, are taking this seriously and we have seen active collaboration uh, in terms of addressing the challenge. Uh, quite a few readers' questions are really concerned, but they're saying, what can we do? Uh, we did approach that earlier, but, uh, you know, they've, they've got skills they're offering to help. They don't know the, how to intersect with, the, with that issue. Um, it's a broad question or a broad set of questions from quite a number of people. So, so I think Latanda has responded. Um, I have two thoughts. One is kind of close to home. We, we've spoken about the challenges in the operating budgets in our national parks. Go, go and visit. Go and visit the park on your doorstep. Get some any money you can back into into the coffers to help them work. The other answer might seem a bit esoteric, but something that occurred to me is that the reason horn is being bought in Vietnam is, is um, primarily for state. It's this conspicuous consumption. People we'll buy this product to make them look and feel good, but it has bad impacts on nature. I think a lot of the reason why people get drawn into criminality around the parks is this um, access to easy, hard cash. So the, it might sound stop odd, but think about all the purchases you make in terms of your your use of water, your use of electricity, your purchase of uh, things involved in plastic. We can all have less impact on the environment, and, and it's, it, um, it all links up in the end. Mm. Can, I can. can I can I stop you there, Latanda? I'll tell you oh, why. Sure, sure. Uh, you guys are, are getting questions coming in too enthusiastically. We really can't uh, approach the war and and we're going to move towards wrapping up there's only a couple of minutes left um, um i just want to give you well it's really two one minute each to wrap up of, about rhino poaching is what would you like to say and who would like to stop i can start uh joe like uh, i think i mean one, I think we, we are acknowledging the fact that we do have a crisis in our hands, uh, but we see also hope uh, in terms of potential interventions, particularly if we act now with regards to finding land. And, uh, and I think, I mean, part of the question is what can we do? Perhaps uh, you can contribute, you know, to efforts uh, to uh, buying, you know, new land that can actually contribute to rhino conservation. I think this opportunity to uh, also um, see that, you know, if it is possible, or it was possible to take, you know, the wide rhino population, for instance, in the 60s from about 200, 300 animals to over 10,000 within sort of about a four decade period, that, um, you know, not all is lost. There is opportunity for us 
to be able okay, to I'm recover, to stop you know, like with the population. Okay. Up, yeah. Sorry, I've got to be policeman here. That's all right. Joe? I would say yeah. not. it's not just about rhino punching. It's an act of killing a rhino. It's about globalized, organized crime networks that are taking advantage of this product and people <laughs> need demand overseas that we don't fully understand. Um, I would add that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, we described how the trajectories of the different species have changed over time. There's a phenomenal number of committed people doing great things for rhinos, and, and it may seem overwhelming, but that makes me positive. Thank you. That's great. Look, thank you both very much for for this for coming on. Um, Thank you, everybody, for listening um, and Daily Maverick for running these webinars um, and also for APSA for supporting the whole process. So I want to thank you all for being here. In a year's time, we're going to talk about rhinos again on Rhino Day, and it's going to be all the good news, okay? Um, thank you very much for being here. Thanks, thank Dan, so and thanks, Joe. Yeah.